Alexei, thank you very much for uh, the introduction. Um, hey guys, uh, so for the next 30 minutes or so, uh, we'll be talking about uh, big data in the context of uh, universities and uh, educational programs. You know, I understand that uh, people before me have been talking a lot about how to teach English. So this is going to be a little bit different. Uh, we'll also talk about education, but uh, we'll talk about education in the context of uh, developing actually uh, new educational programs, uh, uh, making the universities uh, more friendly to a uh, new digital world and actually introducing students to uh, completely new opportunities, uh, which appeared just in the last uh, few years. Uh, I'm a mathematician by education. Uh, I've been teaching uh, game theory, decision-making, big data to uh, political scientists, economists, sociologists, uh, you name it, for the past over 25 years. Uh, in Moscow, for five years, I've been uh, the first vice president of the Skolkovo Institute of Science and Technology, which is the innovation-based university unique in Russia, uh, built together with MIT. And uh, for the past five years, uh, I've been essentially uh, working on uh, probably one of my most favorite projects of my entire life, and actually uh, developing uh, the new infrastructure uh, in a number of Russian universities, uh, where uh, students, faculty, uh, postdocs, uh, any members of university communities actually have access uh, and opportunities to um, dive into the ocean of big data, uh, work with data, develop their own projects, and then uh, turn those projects into something useful academically, commercially, socially, and so on and so forth. So, so I'd like to start, uh, let's see, uh, I think I can share the screen and I'll start with, um, uh, with the presentation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the presentation is in Russian, so I apologize for that. At some point, I'll turn it into English and, uh, we'll, uh, and it, it will be available for you. Uh, the Russian version is also going to be, be available for you. So let me, uh, let me get to the question of big data first. So, so when we talk about big data, one thing we gotta realize that this is a relatively new phenomena and it appeared uh, uh, only in the last you know, 10 years or so. So the graph that you see on the screen is essentially the frequency of searches on big data in Google. And as you can see, uh, uh, it, it, this, uh, this graph started rising uh, at around 2010, 2011, right after the appearance of uh, smartphones. So obviously, uh, social networks, um, uh, human digital footprint, uh, all those things were generated by us human beings using smartphones uh, has, gen has been generating tons of data. Uh, in 2010, Eric Schmidt, the head of Google, had been talking at the conference and basically saying that for the previous seven years, their company uh, acquired about five exabyte of data. Well, five exabyte is five and a bunch of zeros out there. So just to give you a comparison, in 2018, the same amount um, Google Corporation had been uh, acquiring during one day. So seven years before 2010 and one day in 2018. Of course, now uh, it's even more. So, so basically, question is, uh, what is big data and why is it so important? Well, is big data is just when uh, it's more than one terabyte. Is it the data that we can't really put in the computer? Is it uh, any kind of data? Uh, uh, big data is just something that uh, had been invented by marketologists. Well, it really doesn't matter. But what does matter is that now we live in the world where uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of decisions, a lot of issues, a lot of uh, uh, policies are made basically using the data, if not outright. Uh, you probably all heard things like uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning. So all those things are essentially instruments which uh, allow us to use data to uh, do something about that. Now, question is, uh, is it dangerous? Uh, is it good to use big data? Uh, in a few years, we all be using big data or not? Uh, Will our lives be changed forever? 
these are all very interesting questions. Um, so uh, the, the thing about data that uh, we have to understand right now is that uh, we are really in the uncharted waters. As I said, uh, the huge amount of data just started appearing in the last few years. And basically, as a society, as a bunch of human beings, we have no idea how to deal with them, uh, what to do with the data, uh, what kind of tools we should be using, uh, what kind of policies as the state we should be implementing based on the data. Uh, we are now in the process of learning, and that's where uh, universities come in really handy. Uh, when we started our program uh, at, uh, first we started at the Tomsk State University, now it uh, evolved into, onto uh, the whole bunch of universities in Russia. Uh, it's Moscow State University, it's High School of Economics in Moscow, it's uh, Northeastern Federal University and so on and so forth. So basically our principle was very simple. Hey, uh, we're going to make the infrastructure, the data, everything totally open to all the scholars, faculty, students. We're not going to charge any money. Go ahead and uh, start playing with that. And uh, we on our side are going to provide with guidance, with uh, tools, instruments. And for that, uh, we uh, partnered with uh, several uh, key industrial partners. I'm gonna show you uh, in a second who they are. So on the uh, bottom screen, you can see these are such companies as Yandex Cloud, Megaputer, Cribrome, uh, Goods Forecast, Headhunter, Expert. Uh, we partnered with some even charities like uh, Charitable Foundation uh, headed by Vladimir Putanin and so on and so forth. So at this point, we have uh, 31 university participating. We have seven big uh, centers of big data uh, in Russia, and uh, we involve uh, students, faculty, and uh, other members of university community into uh, research, education, and innovation uh, using uh, using the data, using uh, the opportunities that uh, uh, we, they are presented. So basically, uh, uh, our services and uh, the infrastructure that we developed became really uh, in demand uh, when uh, the pandemic hit uh, last year. Because uh, what it turned out that uh, all the universities immediately went into the uh, online mode and uh, they immediately started facing the problems with uh, storing the data, uh, working with the data, analyzing the data, generated through uh, newly online educational process, as well as through all sorts of different uh, human digital footprints, especially through social networks, uh, which needed to be analyzed. Students were complaining, students were uh, showing where uh, the room for improvement was for various universities. And of course, the Ministry of Higher Education in Russia, as well as universities themselves, were very eager to quickly understand uh, what was going on. Just to give you an idea, uh, right when pandemic started, uh, we created the uh, university-based platform called UniProfi, which was uh, analyzing uh, students' digital footprint, their data to uh, match them with potential employers uh, because students largely lost uh, opportunities to make some extra money in cafes and places like that. So uh, it was very urgent need to find some new employment opportunities for students. So we used uh, uh, the database platform to, uh, to organize this process. Uh, another example, uh, uh, various, uh, various regional administrations asked us to uh, quickly show them what was happening in terms of uh, people's uh, attitudes toward uh, various uh, changes which happened during the pandemic. and. Uh, of course, uh, the social networking, the uh, um, uh, essentially the infrastructure that we developed with the data was uh, one of the, if not the best tool. And very quickly, we were able to put together several universities and uh, uh, help them resolve those issues. Of course, we haven't forgotten about our regular programs, for example, uh, we are working very actively on the new international uh, ranking of universities called Three Mission of University. And that's where, uh, especially in the third mission, 
uh, universities' influence on the society, uh, big data come very handy. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna skip this slide. I, I don't think uh, that's uh, that's that important. So let me just uh, tell you what what is really important. So um, uh, we created the network of um, universities, industrial partners, and uh, consumers of those ser services, all centered around the universities, where uh, uh, the key goal is not just uh, complete certain projects, but also uh, teach students, educate students in the area of big data and increase the value of human capital. So uh, to do that, uh, we, of course, uh, couldn't do it uh, only in universities themselves. We needed help and instruments of industrial partners. On the other hand, uh, industrial partners wouldn't be able to do it without the universities because they have their own things to do and they don't have uh, essentially resources for projects which, have, uh, which are socially important. So, uh, why, again, one of my uh, favorite projects, for example, is... Uh, dynamic measuring of uh, quality of life in the regions where, which is basically done by uh, students largely. Okay, uh, so let me just skip this uh, for uh, lack of time. This is a large presentation and it's going to be uh, available for you. So, so what are the sources of our data? Well, first and foremost, these are uh, social media. We do lots of data from social media. We uh, uh, essentially do the whole segment of Russian internet. And then these are uh, all sorts of uh, state purchasing data, Wikipedia, uh, searches on Google and Yandex, uh, university's own data, other open data. Okay, so um, just to give you an idea that, uh, for example, uh, at this point, uh, we have about 90 million live accounts, uh, about uh, 150 million communities that uh, we uh, essentially uh, trace at uh, real time uh, through centers and several universities live. Um, and uh, in the last few minutes, uh, I'm going to talk about two very important uh, student-based uh, projects. So one, one of which I already mentioned, that project is called UniProfi. It's the uh, service of uh, smart employment of students based upon uh, their own resumes, of course, and uh, their digital footprint and the social networks. So uh, uh, the problem is that uh, $20 billion are basically sent every, uh, are spent every year by, by business in Russia to, uh, uh, augment uh, educational skills of students. So essentially, uh, the businesses have to add to uh, student education and spend a lot of money on that. So, uh, so what we did, uh, we took uh, as a pilot pro uh, project, we took uh, Tomsk State University, which is probably the best university or definitely one of the best universities outside of Moscow and Petersburg. And uh, we did a uh, really uh, in-depth uh, benchmark analysis of uh, where the demands were and um, on, on the side of both uh, university graduates who uh, already run or own companies or at top management in serious companies and uh, students themselves. And then we started matching them. And essentially uh, it was very, uh, it was very, uh, productive work. So we uh, partnered with the leading uh, uh, job searches engine in Russia, such as Headhunter. And uh, we got uh, in the first pilot program with about 5,000 students. Uh, we matched them with uh, hundreds of university graduates who were in a position to offer employment. And uh, we got uh, in the end great results. Uh, another uh, project uh, for uh, educational development, which uh, we basically started in our company, uh, it's called ACTRU. This is the infrastructural solution for uh, hybrid education. Uh, essentially, uh, there is really no uh, analog of this uh, in its way, shape, or form uh, anywhere in the world. There are some in the United States, but this is really the truly innovative decision. This is the uh, this is the integrated system between hardware and software, 
which allows to uh, seamlessly record uh, lectures in the classroom when, uh, when the professor is in the classroom. And uh, some students are in the class, some students are in the cafe, some students are at home, some students are in the hallway. So basically it's a, it's a totally uh, spread out solution for uh, uh, hybrid lecturing. And you see the problem here is that you not only have to record lectures in high quality so that uh, they are, uh, uh, they could be then analyzed and uh, watched by students, but you also need to make it uh, very easily for a professor. You have to record the blackboard, the presentation, the professor himself or herself, but you also have to store them uh, in the right way, stream them simultaneously with the lecture itself or uh, in the offline regime, and then do the searches. Uh, you have to index all this data. So basically at this point, you start working with huge amount of data and uh, you have to have the infrastructure for uh, the data analysis. So basically uh, this system, if anybody is interested, would be uh, more than happy to talk more about the system. So this system essentially helps solving the problems where uh, uh, after the pandemic, especially uh, a lot of educational processes will be in the hybrid form with uh, some students being in a classroom and some students uh, outside of the classroom. And finally, I'd like to say a few words before uh, I'll be happy to answer whatever questions you may have about data diving. Data diving is our uh, signature project. These are our uh, specialized schools of uh, applied data analysis. So basically, what do we do in those schools? We bring people from all sorts of different backgrounds of the society and uh, we introduce them to opportunities, methods, and tools which exist now uh, to work with data and to make decisions based upon data. So these people could be professionals. Uh, these people could be uh, some uh, mid to high level government officials, of course, representatives of universities uh, or just private citizens. Uh, we even did uh, the data diving uh, program in. Uh, Russian uh, uh, school for uh, highly gifted and talented students called Sirius in Sochi. Uh, so these are high school students. So basically what do we do? We take this uh, uh, ocean of data and uh, the fact that it's uncharted waters and that we need to dive into the data to actually start learning something about them. And we introduce in a very kind of <clears throat> normal uh, and uh, easy to understand format uh, it to the whole variety of uh, members of the society, including of course, uh, uh, students at the universities and members of uh, academic schools. So uh, in, this, uh, in the schools, uh, we teach them uh, various competencies in the area of uh, data collection and storage. Uh, we do a bunch of really good master classes from uh, leading experts in big data. Uh, we show them how to organize the infrastructure of data collection. And of course, most importantly, we engage them in the project-based learning where they do their own projects and where they uh, use the, the instruments of the industrial park, uh, as well as, um, of course, uh, our own instruments. So um, well, let's see. Um, uh, within that data diving exercise, uh, we did the program called the CDO, which is uh, Chief Data Officers Education. Uh, at that point, uh, we educated 45 teams, uh, about 500 uh, people, 45 pilot projects. So been done again uh, using uh, the infrastructure and in cooperation with the Skolko Institute of Science and Technology, with uh, our universities, uh, which are our partners. Okay, uh, so now we are, uh, again, within that framework of data diving, uh, we've designed a whole bunch of other schools which are conducting uh, all over Russia. And again, uh, the goal there is to essentially bring in as many, as many students as possible from all different layers of the society to introduce them to the methods and mechanisms of, um, of big data. So um, 
Uh, just, you know, uh, one project I'm going to mention and then uh, I'm going to get to Q&A if you guys have any. So, so basically the project I want to mention, it's called education uh, during the times of coronavirus. Big data is the instrument of measuring societal reaction. So, uh, so when coronavirus started, uh, we were asked to very quickly uh, tell the government officials, the Ministry of Higher Education, what was going on in the educational uh, field uh, in terms of uh, difficulties, problems, issues. Uh, so, so what we did, uh, we, we looked at uh, about, about 310 universities from 80 Ru Russia's regions. Uh, we looked at uh, about uh, 3 million, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 1.12 million accounts of students, about uh, 3 million messages, about uh, over 1,000 uh, informal university communities. And uh, we traced them in real time. And basically what we found was very interesting. We found that the key difficulties uh, for students during uh, those times were not uh, technical difficulties were not the difficulties related to internet, computer technologies, and so on and so forth. But there were mostly difficulties related to um, uh, social deprivation. So they really wanted to be uh, with their student or with their friends at lectures, and that's what they were missing. They really wanted to be a part of uh, the educational process in person. So the social deprivation was basically the main problem and the main source of issues, depressions, and so on and so forth. So this is just one example of the project that uh, we did. And by the way, while we were doing this project, we, we realized that uh, uh, the biggest difficulty was uh, to actually take the raw data and uh, turn the raw data into structured data. So we spread the job among uh, about 10 universities and a bunch of students were working on that. And of course, the problem was that, that we didn't have any standards uh, for them. It was very high to do cross-checking of quality of their work. So what we came out, uh, out of this with, uh, we realized that we need to introduce a new uh, set of competences, or I call it the new profession, which uh, we basically invented. And that's called uh, the, uh, the raw content analytic. It's basically uh, a kind of low level uh, introductory uh, profession for uh, students who can uh, start working with data. They don't need any special uh, preparation for that. Uh, we, uh, we designed uh, a very uh, effective and uh, quick educational program where we give them a certificate. And then we introduce various tools which uh, help them uh, uh, turn this raw data into the uh, structured data. That's what uh, any kind of process of um, uh, data analysis begins with. And then they can grow into data scientists, they can grow into the managers of content analysts. But this is the first step which needed to be done. And uh, now we are going to uh, educate a lot of students in that area. So I think I will uh, stop here. And uh, I'll be very happy to answer whatever questions um, you guys may have. I think we have about five minutes left. Anybody wants to ask a question? <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, if, uh, if there are no more questions, then uh, I'm happy to give that extra couple of minutes to the next speaker. Okay, thank you very much. There, uh, there, uh, there is one question from Yelena Rubikina in the chat. And the question is, will you be so kind to share with your experience how to teach the moral points? How to teach the moral points? Wow, <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually a very good question. You know, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult question. Uh, 
Uh, in our consortium, we have um, one of my colleagues uh, who is working on uh, actually quantifying uh, the cultural code of uh, Russian people. Uh, her name is uh, Yekaterina Mityagina. She is from uh, uh, Vyatka State University from Kirov. Uh, and um, yeah, this is uh, basically uh, in what we do with the data that probably as close as it gets to uh, trying to actually uh, kind of have a scientific approach to uh, teaching the moral points. Uh, as, a, as a person, not as a data scientist, uh, I can tell you that uh, I grew up in the Soviet Union and uh, I was uh, in a pioneer organization in Komsomol, so I went through all those things. And uh, whatever we think about this old Soviet, you know, uh, communist ideologists, I have to tell you that uh, they were doing a pretty good job in teaching us good moral points. Of course, uh, it's impossible to do right now. However, uh, as I said, uh, if you are interested in actually learning uh, how to translate uh, our cultural uh, predisposition and uh, our pre-programmed moral points into the educational environment, then uh, I can refer you to Yekaterina. She, by the way, uh, just a few weeks ago, introduced that project to uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin at the meeting of leaders of Russia. And he really liked that idea. So you may like that idea too. Okay, thank you so much for the answer. And uh, it seems that people are saying thank you in the chat. They say, thank you, thanks a lot, and so on. Uh, so it looks like currently there are no more big questions. And I'd like to give the floor to Rizlika Mardiana, uh, professor from the Department of English Education uh, in Indonesia. And we're happy to 